Making your way in the world today takes everything you got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Hey, sometimes you wanna go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came You wanna be where you can see Our troubles are all the same You wanna be where everybody knows your name morning and welcome to the Seven Hills Fellowship live stream worship service. Let me ask that wherever you are right now, if you would stand for the call to worship. The call to worship is taken today from Psalm 134. We're going to be reading verses 1 and 2. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who is the maker of heaven and earth.
Anger, fear, chaos, uncertainty. Right now, most of us in this world are filled with all of these emotions. Now, what's wonderful about Scripture and wonderful about God our Father is that He doesn't tell us to stuff those things or to hide them away or to show up once we put them away. Rather, God invites us to bring all of those emotions to Him, and we're going to do that right now as we pray. 
I want to simply invite you to, uh, to join with us. It will be myself and David Elmer and Krista as we are going to be praying a prayer that's called a prayer for a time of widespread suffering. Let me begin. Christ, our King, our world is overtaken by unexpected calamity and by a host of attending fears and worries and insecurities. We witness suffering, confusion, and hardship multiplied around us. And we find ourselves swept up in the same anxieties and troubles, dismayed by so many uncertainties. Now we turn to you, O God, in this season of our common distress. Be merciful, O Christ, to those who suffer, those who worry, to those who grieve, those who are threatened or harmed in any way by this upheaval. Let your holy compassions be active throughout the world, even now, tending the afflicted, comforting the brokenhearted, and bringing hope to many who are hopeful. Use even these hardships to woo our hearts nearer to you, O God. O Father, may these days of disquiet become a catalyst for conviction and repentance for the tendering of our affections, for the stirring of our sympathies, for the refining of our love. We are your people who are called by you. We need not be troubled or alarmed. Indeed, O Lord, let us love now more fearlessly, remembering that you created us and appointed us to live in these very places in the midst of these unsettled times. It is no surprise to you that we are here now, sharing in this turmoil along with the rest of our society. For you have called your children to live as salt and light among the nations, praying and laboring for the flourishing of communities where we dwell, acting as agents of your forgiveness, salvation, healing, reconciliation, and hope in the very midst of an oft-troubled world. And in these holy vocations, you have not left us helpless, O Lord, because you have not left us at all. Your spirit remains among us. Inhabit now your church in the spirit of the risen Christ. Unite and equip your people in your work before them. Father, empower your children to do this work. In times of distress, let us respond, not as those who have instinctively entrenched our own self-preservation, but rather as those who, in imitation of their Lord, would move in humble obedience towards the needs and hurts of their neighborhoods and communities. You were not ashamed to share in our sufferings, Jesus. Let us now be willing to share in yours, serving as your visible witnesses in this broken world. Hear now these words, you children of God, and be greatly encouraged. The Lord's throne in heaven is yet occupied. His rule is eternal, and his good purposes on earth will be forever accomplished. So we, we need never be swayed by the brief and passing panics of this age. Ages, O Christ, and history is held in your Father's hands. We, your people, know the good and glorious end of this story. Our heavenly hope is secure. In this time of widespread suffering, then, let us rest afresh in the surpassing peace of that vision, that your whole church on earth might be liberated to love more generously and sacrificially. Now labor in and through us, O Lord, extending and multiplying the many expressions of your mercy. Amen.
next song is, you may recognize it as Be Thou My Vision, but it's really a common hymn tune that a lot of hymns have been put to. So we've, we've mixed a few together. Um.
Father, I pray that we would live the words of this song, Be Thou My Vision. Father, I pray that we would join with Moses in asking to see your glory. And in the same way that you showed Moses a fraction of your glory and he was changed forever, Father, I pray that you would be our vision and we too would be changed forever as we see you, the living God. We pray these things now in the name of your Son. Jesus Christ. Amen. At this point in time, for those of you who are at home, let me remind you that this is an opportunity to continue worshiping God through the giving of his tithes and our offerings. And there are lots of ways in which we talk about this. But one of the things that we do with, your tith- with God's tithes and your offerings is we seek to bring flourishing to Rome as a community. There's also a very real sense in which our hearts follow our giving. And so it not only changes the community that we live in for the better, but it changes us as well. So let's remember that we can continue giving God his tithes and our offerings. We can do that online, uh, or we can do it via the mail as well. At this point, let me change gears and make a actually more than a couple of announcements. Um, you can see them on your screen. Uh, first of all, we're going to continue this live streaming ad infinitum. It will be at 1015 on Sunday mornings, and if you can't make it at 1015, that's okay. These will be recorded and then posted online, uh, and you can watch them on YouTube as well. Let me continue to ask people to fill out connection cards. Uh, One of the primary ways that we're going to be able to communicate to you is through a weekly email that goes out um, called the 7 at 7. And so the way you get on that list is by filling out a connection card. Now, you can also put prayer requests and other things on that as well. But if you haven't filled out a connection card, let me invite you to do so today. Um, Next. Uh, We are uh, back in the mode of doing youth group via Zoom. Um, The junior high will be meeting at 5 p.m. today via a Zoom link. And then the high school will be meeting from 6.30 to 8 o'clock via a Zoom link. If you have any questions about that, then you can contact Rob Edens. Um, One of the things that uh, we've been doing over the last several months now is I've been filming these Tuesday devotionals. They're devotionals that are going out via Instagram, but also via Facebook as well. I'm sorry, YouTube as well. And what I'm really doing is I'm unpacking suffering and people's experiences of suffering, but in particular, how God strengthened them and encouraged them and kept them afloat during their times of suffering. So we, uh, we talked about uh, we, with Rob Edens, and we interviewed Cabell Sweeney. We interviewed Jessica Minton. This Tuesday, we're going to be doing Maddie Maxwell. And so if you're interested in meeting some of the people of Seven Hills Fellowship and being encouraged by their stories, please check in on Tuesdays. Again, these will go out via Instagram via YouTube. Again, I've been talking about uh, the Redeemer formational email now for quite some time. It's uh, an email that goes out morning and evening with prescribed readings from scripture and also prayer. We would love to have our people, the people of Seven Hills Fellowship, reading those scriptures and praying those prayers together. A couple more things. We are actually going to be doing God Party 3.0 this summer. We're going to be doing it in some unique ways, and so you can find out about God Party 3.0. That's sort of our version uh, of a musical um, children's ministry in the summertime, and so check that out online. Uh, Next, we'll be doing backyard sessions tonight at 8.30 p.m. for college and young adults in Jefferson's backyard. So backyard sessions tonight at 8.30. There will be appropriate social distancing for college and young adults. Last two things. Some of you know Julianne Bailey has been the person who's been in uh, charge of scheduling the Great Room over the last eight years. And uh, Julianne Bailey just stepped down as uh, our building coordinator. And so if you guys know Julianne, I would encourage you to send her a text, send her an email, give her a call, say thank you, give her a gift certificate. We will uh, offer our thanks as well. But let me just publicly thank Julianne for all that she's done for us for the last eight years. And then finally, some of you guys know that um, Katie Fitzsimmons, who has been our youth minister over the last five and a half years, if, if you can't tell, she's pregnant. I believe she's eight months pregnant at this point in time. 
And so she is actually stepping down from her position as youth minister. Uh, she'll continue to do admin at the church. But after five and a half years of loving on the kids of Seven Hills Fellowship, I'd love to ask that you do the same thing that you did for Julianne. Send her a text, send her an email, give her a phone call, give her a gift card, let her know how much you appreciate uh, the time and the energy that she's put in with the young people of Seven Hills Fellowship. All right, at this point in time, let's transition to the sermon. Now, some of you know, if you tuned in last week, that the topic for last week's sermon was the good life, the good life. And so I'll ask the same question this week that I asked last week, which is, what is your picture, what's your vision of the good life? What does it look like for you? It might look like family, right? It might look like friends. It might look like food. It might look like rest and leisure and play. But what about work? Maybe it should look like work as well. Listen to what Tolstoy has to say about his vision of the good life. He says this, a quiet, secluded life in the country with the possibility of being useful to people to whom it is easy to do good and who are not accustomed to have it done to them. Then work, which one hopes may be of some use. Then rest, nature, books, music, love for one's neighbor. Such is my idea of happiness. What a great description of the good life. But the question, of course, for us is, what is the Bible? What does God have to tell us about the good life. Last week, we took a look at how God communicates very clearly that friendship is one aspect of the good life, and we basically unpacked uh, all of the things that Scripture, at least some of the things Scripture had to say about friendship in the following statement. We said this, true friendship is selfless and sacrificial. It makes us strong and makes life satisfying. False friendship or unhealthy friendship, on the other hand, is self-seeking and at best will make us miserable and at worst will lead to our destruction. Today, we're going to be taking a look at what the Bible has to say about work. But before we do that, let me take one moment and let's pray. Father, I thank you that your word gives us an instruction manual of sorts through stories, uh, through wisdom literature, um, through the Psalms, what it is that the good life ought to look like um, for us as your followers, as your children. And so, Father, I pray that we would surrender to you and that we would trust what you have to tell us since you are the author of reality, the author of humanity, the author of all these things that we see, feel, and touch. You're the author of our ontology. Let us surrender to you and do our best to live the good life as you describe it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the movie Hugo is based on a book by the same name. Uh, it was created by Martin Scorsese. And in 2011, it was nominated for Best Picture. It also won a Golden Globe. The basic story follows the life of a 12-year-old boy named Hugo Cabaret. You can see a picture of uh, the movie title here uh, above my left shoulder. And what happens in the story is that this young boy has already lost, lost his mother in Paris back in the 30s. So he's living with his father, who's a museum curator. But then his father dies in a fire. So he goes to live with his uncle, who runs the clocks, uh, in a train station in the middle of Paris called Gare de Montparnasse. And so what happens is his uncle ends up dying, and Hugo, as a 12-year-old boy, is left alone to run all the clocks in this station. All the while, however, he's trying to keep from getting arrested and put into an orphanage. Now, along the way, we see all of these different people and their stories that live life and work in this train station. We're introduced to a man named Georges Melier. And what's interesting is he's working in the train station as a toy salesman, but what we find out later in the story is that he was actually a former filmmaker before World War I, but he's now a very broken man because of the war. Not only that, but we run into a character named Inspector Gustave, who is a policeman whose uh, beat is the, the train station there, and uh, he too is broken from the war. He wears a, uh, a brace on his leg, and then we meet Mama Jean, and Mama Jean was also uh, a former actress who is broken. Lizette runs a flower stand in the station. She's broken as well. And all of these people's stories, Hugo and all of his, these characters, are filmed against the backdrop of an automaton or a robot that his father uh, had given Hugo. And what's interesting is they can't figure out how to make the robot work. They can't figure out what it was designed to do. There's this one scene where Hugo climbs up into the clock tower and he overlooks the city of Paris 
and he says this. It's not going to be on the screen. But he says this, I like to imagine that the world is one big machine. You know, machines never have any extra parts. They have the exact number and type of parts they need. So I figure if the entire world is a big machine, I have to be here for some reason. And that means that you have to be here for some reason too. He goes on to say, maybe that's why a broken machine always makes me a little sad because it isn't able to do what it was meant to do. Maybe it's the same with people, he says. Hugo continued, if you lose your purpose, it's like you're broken. So I totally recommend this little movie, Hugo. Uh, It's ultimately a work about many things or a movie about many things, but it's definitely about work. It's definitely about vocation, if you will. In other words, what were you created to do? And one of the things that scripture makes clear is that work is a part of the good life according to to God. Work isn't something to escape, rather it's something to embrace. It's what we were created for. Here's the thesis statement for today. It's this. As humans, we were created to work. As humans, we were created to work. When we work as God intended for us to work, then our lives will be blessed. However, when we don't, we will end up miserable and unfulfilled, unsatisfied. Let's look at that first clause. As human beings, we were created to work. Let's look at Genesis 1 and 2. They say this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And so men and women are created in God's image. Verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Moving along to Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. The Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And so the image we have here is that God created Adam and Eve in his image to work. There's an old Hungarian saying which says, you always fall off one side of the horse or the other. You always fall off one side of the horse or the other. And what that means is that as humans, we tend towards imbalance or we tend to lack balance in our lives. That's true in most areas of life, but it's definitely clearly true when it comes to our perspective on work. Some people conceive of work as something to escape and to avoid at all costs. Those people, when they go to socialsecurity.com, they check that they want to retire at 62. And secretly, they might hope that they can get workers' comp so they can stop working even sooner than that. To them, work is something to be avoided and escaped. For others, however, Work is where they find their ultimate identity, and therefore they define themselves primarily by what they do. They sacrifice family, they sacrifice friendships, they sacrifice their relationship with God, even their physical health on the altar of work. And we've seen the results of both of these extremes. In fact, we've probably experienced the results of both of these extremes. Both imbalances have a corrosive impact psychologically, physically, relationally, and spiritually. Now, allowing for both of those qualifications, work, again, is what we were created to do. Our initial ontology or state of being was to walk with God and to care for the garden, to work. And all of this was not after the fall, but it was before the fall. So before sin entered the world, our ontology was to work. The verses from Genesis 1 and 2 above use words like filling, and subduing, ruling, and working, and caring for the garden. Those words describe what we are created to do, our vocation. In their book, Intimate Allies, Tremper Longman and Dan Allender argue that our job as humans, whether as individuals or as married persons, is to bring order to chaos, that ultimately we're to bring order to chaos. Think for just a moment about what the world would look like without doctors. I would have suffered and I would have been dead in a year or two from cancer. That would have led to physical chaos, but it also would have led to relational chaos and psychological chaos, economic chaos. Or think about the world if all of the electricians and the plumbers disappeared, chaos. What about the homemakers among us? Without their work, our private worlds would descend into chaos. One of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes is found on page 262 of the letters of C.S. Lewis. He says this. He says, I think I can understand that feeling 
about a housewife's work being like that of Sisyphus, who was the stone rolling gentleman, we would say uh, that it's not just housewives, but it's any homemaker. But it is surely in reality the most important work in the world. What do ships, railways, mines, cars, government, etc., exist for except that people may be fed, warmed, and safe in their own homes? As Dr. Johnson said, to be happy at home is the end of all human endeavor. We wage war in order to have peace. We work in order to have leisure. We produce food in order to eat it. So your job is the one for which all others exist. So what? So what about this idea that we were created to work? I'd like for you to think one moment about that idea, about that truth. Work is what you were designed to do. You were designed to have a vocation, to work, to have a place as Hugo said, in that giant machine. How might wrestling with that realization change how you work? Or how should that realization change the way that you embrace your work and think about your work? As humans, we were created to work. And when we work as God intended, our lives will be blessed. However, when we don't, we'll end up miserable and unfulfilled. Let's move to our second point. When we work as God intended for us to work, our lives will be blessed. Theodore Roosevelt, who I love to quote, he's got several great quotes that I like, says this, no man or no one needs sympathy because he has work to do, because he has a burden to carry. Far and away, the best prize that life offers is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. He understood the purpose of work. Let's jump in and see what the Bible has to say about work. The hand of the diligent will rule. In other words, those people who are diligent in their work will be entrusted with authority. He will get precious wealth. Proverbs 21, the plans of the diligent lead to profit, as surely as haste leads to poverty. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will serve before kings, honor. He will not serve before obscure men, Proverbs 22. Proverbs 28, those who work Their land will have abundant food. They'll be filled. They'll be satisfied. But those who chase fantasies will have their fill of poverty. Proverbs 12. The lazy do not roast any game, but the diligent feed on the riches of the hunt. And then finally, Ecclesiastes. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This is from the hand of God. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. When we take all of these verses and we lump them together into some sort of a jambalaya, what we see is that when we work as God intended for us to work, we experience deep satisfaction and we experience blessing in life. So what are the blessings of good work according to all these verses? According to these verses, the blessings are as follows. Positions of influence, authority, wealth, honor, respect, independence, freedom, and finally, happiness, fulfillment, and satisfaction. Sounds like the good life to me. If you look at these particular verses, you will see people employed all over the vocational spectrum. You've got management and farmers, hunters, and artisans. And if you expand further into scripture, you'll see small business owners, politicians, influencers, and homemakers. And what gives them satisfaction isn't necessarily the nature of their work, but it's the motive behind it. Paul, writing to the Colossian church, gave the following admonition. This is chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So Paul was saying, ultimately, the work that we do is a service rendered to God. Ultimately, the work we do is a service rendered to God. I'm not sure who recommended it to me or where I first heard about it, but sometime in my late teenage years, I read a book called The Practice of of the presence of God by Brother Lawrence, the practice of the presence of God by Brother Lawrence. He was a Parisian monk who was a cook in a Carmelite monastery. So his job was not something that most of us would perceive to be something that was particularly uh, valued in our culture today. 
But this little book impacted not only my idea of living life in the presence of God, but it also impacted my view of work. Listen to the following quote by Brother Lawrence. He says this, it's not necessary to have great things to do. Let that sink in just for a second. and Let that butt up against common wisdom. It's not necessary to have great things to do. I turn my little omelet in the pan for the love of God. When it is finished, if I have nothing to do, I prostrate myself on the ground and adore my God who gave me the grace to make it. After which I arise more content than a king. When I cannot do anything else, it is enough for me to have lifted a straw from the earth for the love of God. What if we could pay that bill for the love of God? What if we could return that email for the love of God? What if we could mow that grass, change that diaper, have that Zoom meeting, finish the budget, write that lesson plan all for the love of God? What if we were able to turn our omelet in the pan for the love of God? Our lives would be blessed and we would be fulfilled and we would be a blessing to others as well. As humans, we were created to work. When we work as God intended for us to work, our lives will be blessed. However, when we don't, we'll end up miserable and unfulfilled. That's our last point. When we don't work as God intended us to work, we will most likely end up miserable and unfulfilled. Tim Keller says this in his book, Every Good Endeavor. He says, work is so foundational to our makeup that it is one of the few things we can take in significant doses without harm. Indeed, the Bible does not say we should work one day and rest six, or that work and rest should be balanced evenly, but he directs us to the opposite ratio. Leisure and pleasure are great goods, but we can only take so much of them. Leisure and pleasure are great goods, but we can only take so much of them. I have a, a friend from my childhood um, who, due to some uh, situations in his life, became uh, very wealthy. And it was interesting because I've known him for years now, and I think I can safely say that he's one of the least, or he has been one of the least happy people I know. He's really struggled in life because he hasn't had to work and oftentimes has chosen not to. But it's interesting because recently he began working and doing a job which most of us would consider very difficult and very challenging. And by the way, he's one of the hardest working people I actually know. But it's interesting because I ran into him not long ago and I asked him, I said, how is your heart now that you're doing this vocation, this job? And he said, I'm excited to get up every morning at 7 a.m. and I go to work and I take my break and I love it. I've never been happier, right? In other words, the avoidance of work didn't make him happy, but rather it's work that led to blessing in his life. Here's what Proverbs 6 has to say, verses 6 through 11. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. I'm gonna read a chunk of other verses. I'm, I've been more and more trying to get into scripture myself regularly and trying to lead our people into scripture. So I'm gonna read a big cluster of verses here. Proverbs 21. The sluggard's craving will be the death of him because his hands refuse to work. The shiftless man goes hungry. In other words, that person is unfulfilled. They're unsatisfied because they refuse to work. Proverbs 6. Ask a sluggard, how long will you lie there? He cannot answer when. He doesn't refuse to work. He just delays a little. A little more sleep, that's all. And so sometimes it's not that the sluggard or the lazy person refuses to work outright, but it's just the product of inertia. It's so hard to get up. Proverbs 10, I applied my heart to what I observed and lazy hands make a man poor. Now again, some forms of poverty are a byproduct of laziness, others aren't. All work, Proverbs 14, brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Proverbs 21, The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. So careless work or just trying to get it done as quickly as possible. Can I get an amen from teachers and parents who have chores for their children? But just trying to get your work done in haste does not and will not lead 
uh, to happiness in the long run. However, having a plan and working that plan will lead to success. Proverbs 26, as a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. Proverbs 10, as vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so are sluggards to those who send them. Laziness doesn't just make you miserable, it makes those who count on you miserable too. So, in contrast to the person who works diligently and receives power and receives authority, wealth, honor, respect, satisfaction, and fulfillment, independence, and freedom, the person who refuses to work or the person who is lazy in their work or hasty in their work receives the due reward for their labor, destruction, death, dissatisfaction, self-induced poverty, dishonor, disdain, hunger, and emptiness. The sluggard or the lazy person is not only empty physically, but maybe more importantly, they are empty spiritually and emotionally because they are estranged from their very design, right? They're not flourishing because they're estranged from the very way that God, the author of humanity, made them. Now, Let me pause here for just a moment and ask you to think about how you are doing your work. How are you doing your work, what you're called to do? Your vocation at the moment may be that of a student. Are you being diligent? Are you working hard at it? My junior year, I began to intentionally embrace my studies after years of hating school and barely tolerating it. And what happened was is that I began to enjoy being a student and to enjoy learning. Maybe your work right now is coaching or teaching, or maybe your work is homeschooling. There's no doubt that whatever your vocation is, it will be filled with thorns and thistles, and it will be done by the sweat of your brow. Genesis 3 makes that clear, but it's also true that if and when we work with diligence as unto the Lord, we will be fulfilled. And if we don't work as God intended, it's almost inevitable that we'll end up miserable and dissatisfied with life because as humans, we were created to work. And when we work as God intended for us to work, we will end up blessed and we'll be a blessing to others. And when we don't, we will be miserable and unfulfilled. So what? So what about all of this stuff? That's a lot to process. In his book, Every Good Endeavor, Tim Keller says this, in Genesis, we see God as a gardener. And in the New Testament, we see him as a carpenter. No task is too small a vessel to hold the immense dignity of work given by God. Let me read that one more time. No task is too small a vessel to hold the immense dignity of work given by God. Our work has dignity no matter how menial no matter how small, no matter how much we think it is insignificant, because in it, we are reflecting the image of God in us. That is one of the most noble tasks we could possibly be given or undertake. Jesus, the creator of the universe, experienced true dignity and true satisfaction in his work. Jesus experienced that. All of Jesus' labor, whether it was as a carpenter or as a teacher or as the ultimate substitute and sacrifice, all of it was rooted in an unyielding desire to bring glory to his Father. The night before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed in the presence of his disciples. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. What is your work? What is your work? At the end of our lives, may we echo the words of Jesus saying, I too have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. Let's take one moment and let's pray. Father, I thank you for this um, countercultural idea that we were created to work. Father, I thank you that not only do you tell us that's what we were made for, but you even give us direction of how it is that we're to work and why it is that we are to work. And so, Father, I pray that we would surrender to you as the author of reality, 
as the author of our ontology, and that as we do so, Father, I pray that you would give us blessing. I pray, Father, that you would give us satisfaction and fulfillment, and I pray, Father, that you would actually reward the fruits of our labor, not only for us, not only for our family, but for the entire world, Father. I pray that you would protect us from the evil one. I pray that you would protect us from what the world may teach about work that doesn't line up with what you teach about it. And then, Father, I pray that you would protect us from our own flesh. I pray, Father, that we would work because you created us to work. And as we do so, Father, I pray that we would experience the blessing and fulfillment of that hard work in life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
are uh, watching from home, let me ask that you stand now for the benediction, and you can raise your hands, or if you'd like to put your arms around uh, your family members or friends near you, you can do that as well. But receive now the benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.